Are we ready to rumble? We're ready. We're ready to go. Steve said, are we ready to rumble? We're ready to practical, practically apply what we just experienced. Because the Warriors is playing at 5 o'clock right when we're done. Okay. And, you know, that's the most important thing. That's important. What did he say? The Warriors, Golden State's playing today at 5 o'clock, so we've got some business to, to accomplish. Yes. It's beautiful. He said, let's get busy. And what's funny is, the only LGBT sports bar in this whole in this whole Bay Area happens to be four doors down. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus has given you everything. You know, it just happens. It just keeps happening. These miracles just keep rolling before you can say Jack Robinson. There it next, is. The next miracle's here. The Warriors are playing and Steve's, Steve's bar he's going to is nearby. Five o'clock they're starting, so we've got between now and five, four... We get on to those important Golden State Warriors. Go ahead. Joe. Yeah, um, I have a question about what you were saying right at the end about how everything that happens to you, you choose to happen, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know that's in the course. Um, it just seems like I don't believe that. Right? Like, there's things in the Course that I believe, in fact, not only believe, but it's discoverable in the moment. Like, how you respond to what happens determines your state of mind. If you, something happens and you forgive, you're in peace. If you respond in grievance, you're miserable. That's provable right in this moment. So it's not even belief, it's no. But that, to me, is just like some theoretical notion that just seems like, I don't see how that could be. Because like, yeah. if I get like, a car accident, it's like, I don't want this, you know? I mean, if I forgive it, I'll be in peace. If I'm in grievance, I'll be miserable. But I, it, it doesn't ring true that I wanted that. Yeah. What do I do with that? Very good. Well, Joe's asked a really good question because uh, the the point that of mind that sees that all things work together for good and there are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment, the point of mind that understands that uh, that everything is working perfectly is is the atonement. So Joe is basically stating. Uh, I'm, a, I'm identified as being a human being. I've, I, I write my screenplays. I do my psychotherapy work. I go along. I'm just trying to follow the course in the best way that I can, and I don't get this part that everything works together for good. Of course not. You know, that's the, the point. You're opening to let those concepts come up and be given over to the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit can lead you concept by concept, mm -hmm. including psychotherapy, including writing amazing screenplays, mm -hmm. the things that you are inspired to do, mm -hmm. that you feel that connection working in you and through you. And to, to help answer Joe's question, it's like, it's interesting, uh, we, we had dinner with uh, Judy Scutch, as, as Lisa was saying, and, and basically, when, at the very end, before uh, we left, Judy said, here, I'm, I, I want you to hear this message because when the four of us came together all those years ago, we didn't know what we were doing. Uh, we're just like saying, okay, what next? Because they had, you know, Helen had received all these notes that Bill had typed out and they had them in black binders, but they didn't know what to do with them. They had them all hidden. They were kind of frightened to think these two research psychologists, if people see what's in these black binders, we could lose our jobs. Or, even worse, our colleagues could be told that, that there's this lady that's hearing this inner dictation, inner voice from Jesus, and she calls herself a research psychologist. What do, research, what do psychologists and psychiatrists do oftentimes when people are hearing voices? They diagnose them. <laughs> You know, it's not a really good thing to do. So anyway, this is what Judy received. Like you're asking the question, what do you do in a practical way? Maybe we could hear about that. This is what she received, and actually Lisa 
She gave it to Lisa to read out loud for us, but this is the beginning days of the Course. And, and this is still as applicable. I would say it's Jesus speaking to Joe and saying, here you go. You don't have to figure out that stuff about it's all perfect uh, because you don't believe that yet. But this is, this is what we could say. This is for Joe now. <laughs> the Course has very long-range goals which could not possibly be recognized now. None of you has found his true function yet. This is because the central factor in the plan has not yet emerged and the parts cannot fall into place at this time. It will begin to be clear this summer. <laughs> 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 Joe's like, yeah! <laughs> it will begin to be clear this summer, but will not be fully understood for some time. That's good enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Nor is it necessary to be clearer than is needed to show you the ways you are to go to be of most help in your appointed roles. Each has been very carefully chosen, and there have been no accidents, nor accidental meetings. God watches over His Word and over His messengers. Trust only that. It would be impossible to explain the details which depend on things that have not yet happened, people not yet met, and events that have not yet occurred. You will, be, you will still be told what to do in any particular instance, any time you ask. As time goes on, some of the answers will seem quite surprising. Yes. Rejoice that when that happens, it means the next phase has begun. <laughs> Everything that you are doing now will disappear and you will not remember it in the light of what will happen afterward. Little children, be not afraid. Just think of this. God is the real foundation of the Course. It needs you only in His name. Would He then not tell you what to do and help you do it? Great. Isn't that practical? <laughs> So, that's how practical this is. We ask, we listen, we receive, we go forward taking what's given for us. Our function is dictated moment by moment. We follow those deep intuitive feelings. When the ego tries to scare us and tries to tell us we're not making progress, we're never going to get this, it's too difficult, we don't heed that voice. You know, our way is set. We would not be here having these talks and conversations if there wasn't a tremendous willingness inside of us to open up to be miracle workers. How many of us, when we were children, were sitting at the dinner table at eight having our parents say, you're going to grow up to be an amazing miracle worker, <laughs> you know. Not me, I don't know about the rest of you, but that was not the conversation at the dinner table. And yet, that's exactly what's happening. We are being trained to be miracle workers. Now, we told the parable, like with my parable, Lisa's parable, we work with, a, I mean, the, the outreach goes all over the world and reaches, reaches seemingly many hundreds and hundreds of people, and same with the internet. But basically, as far as living together, we just have a, a community of, what is there, maybe 20, 30? 20 to 30. 20 to 30 people that we work very closely with. And, and we're really devoted to living and demonstrating in attitude A Course in Miracles. I happen to speak about the book, but even among the original four, you know, Bill wasn't really given... Uh, a, like what we would call a major teaching function in terms of words. Even at the end of his life, he would show up at course groups smiling, peaceful, happy, and he still wasn't speaking. <laughs> he was mostly quiet. 
in those groups in, here in California, in Northern California and Southern California. Helen had a very particular role as a scribe, which was a highly developed scribal ability from seemingly many lifetimes, and she still had so much terror and fear around that gift because she had misused it in the past as a priestess. And she still had guilt and shame about the misuse of the scribal ability. So what could have taken perhaps maybe a year and a half took seven years because there was a huge amount of resistance. And, and mostly what was going on in those seven years was she would take some things down shorthand very quickly and very often, very frequently, Jesus would say, what I said was this, what you wrote was that. And so it took seven years of going, let's go back <laughs> again, and, and all of that. So we're all doing the best that we can do, but there's, there's fear, there's resistance there. There's a fear of the light. There's a fear that we really did something terribly wrong. We screwed up, we messed up. That's the separation. And, and then, even now, when we accept our function, there's still going to be some shaking, some fear, trepidation about that. Because the ego part is very afraid of being undone. It's afraid of loss. It believes it's going to be annihilated and it's going to lose its entire self and world and cosmos. And that's kind of the direction we could say it is moving that way, but it's through a retranslation. It's not through a killing or a, a destruction. We're not going to kill the ego. You know, you're not going to wipe it away in some kind of way like the sentinels and, you know, the matrix where they're out there trying to search and destroy. The, the Holy Spirit is not doing search and destroy. It's doing, bring it to me and I'll shine it away. I'll reinterpret it for you. So we're doing that. So we'll try. We'll find a way to get this uh, copied. copied. If, if there's, uh, yeah, we can give it to or who, however you have so a that email. So came to her at the time of the four of them. Yes, and she happened to just have it for us and yes. and pull it out and Xerox copies for for all of us at lunch. Yeah. So we won't know the summer. <laughs> <laughs> well, now. Yeah. It's, Joe's right now. Joe's ready for the summer. <laughs> <laughs> Joe says it's right here and now. <laughs> yeah. So what we want to do is we want to open it up because only reason we share these parables is to start to shed some light into how it can be helpful as you're going through the mind training, as you're going from this loosening of this self-concept. That's the practical nature of it. And there is a part of the Course where Jesus says, you can learn from my experiences and from the experiences of your brothers. So that's why we have these meetings. That's why we come together to witness and share, because it helps strengthen our belief that we can actually do this. You know, it helps us to be around those that are sharing these kind of experiences. And what I've shared, and, and with Lisa's life of extreme examples, those are extreme teaching learning opportunities, because it kind of gives you a bigger context for the awakening. Like, don't be so disappointed when so-and-so dies, or you get fired from a job, or even if you go into a spiral, where it seems like you're depressed and suicidal, or you're extremely fearful, don't think that that's all she wrote, you know. That's the reason we're sharing these things, because you have to keep rising up. Mm. I kept calling Lisa. She All kept coming back. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. I was just sharing with him, you know, it was like the minute that we actually met in that time of, I want joy. It's like that was our connection forever. It was like, mm. it was a commitment, you know, to that joy authentically and to forgive. And just David would call me when I was in the darkness and he would just say, Lisa, I love you. Everything's okay. I love you. And I think, this guy's nuts. He won't leave me alone. Like, doesn't he take a hint? Because I don't want to really be bothered with him. And he just, it was, it was unending. Uh, yeah, complete forgiveness. That's what I have to say. That was what the powerful thing is. And that's what it really is. It's a demonstration of forgiveness. And, you know, I would have a lot of guilt and a lot of shame and, and things when I would rejoin with him just of me falling. 
Like I would fall and have to get back up, and he would just say to me every time, come on, let's go, we have work to do. You know, we'd never look back. It was never, ever looking back at what happened or what didn't happen. It was like, let's keep going. Let's just keep moving forward. Just that unconditional love, which is, which is really imperative, and the non-judgment. And so I feel like that's what I love, joining with everybody. Like, we're all in this together. You know, that commitment, really, for the non-judgment. And don't be concerned, too, about the, whatever the form is, whatever the concepts are. The Holy Spirit can and does use absolutely everything. There's nothing that you could say or do or believe in that the Holy Spirit would go, hmm, that's, that's bad. That's, you've gone too far. That's actually too far. Uh, yeah, we've had so many, we've actually had so many experiences. This is like the tip of the iceberg. We just gave you some of the highlights, but... There was actually one time where I was traveling overseas and, and I think I came up to Wisconsin and I needed to get back to my little peace house in Cincinnati and Lisa was up there in Wisconsin and so uh, I said, well, I don't really want to fly back um, but I, I would like to, uh, I've got all these bags and bags of luggage and everything and she said, okay, I'm, I'm with you, whatever you want to do. So. This is the way spirit works with me. Anything goes. So instead of flying back, I, I was guided to go to eBay in the vehicle section and to go, <laughs> and I think for like $500. $300. It was $300. You and, a car for $300. So <laughs> instead of buying the ticket, you know, and everything, I, I thought, well, there's two of us, then I'll go with eBay. So I, I got this little, I found this little red car for for a few hundred dollars and it didn't or something. Have a muffler. And it didn't, it didn't have a muffler. And anyway, we we go there together, and it's this like a hippie house, and we have this great holy encounter. That's what it's all about, you know. It, it spirit takes uses me in all kinds of unconventional. We have a great holy encounter, and we're there, and we we're just having a great time with them. They sell us the the car, so we get in the car. We we're driving from Wisconsin down. I think we go through. A, a, we're into Indiana somewhere, and we drive and drive, and we finally, we have lunch, and we stop, and we finally, she said, okay, come on, let's get a motel for the night. She said, I'm springing for the motel as the car is boom, 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 going along. <laughs> We're in a, a red car with no muffler. It had a bit of a hole in the muffler. It wasn't falling off. It was... Good for a mystic, you know. It was, it was, it moved. <laughs> we were getting from A to B. So, and my luggage was in it. So there we go. So we, so we get in the motel. We're there. We sleep. She's, she's over in her bed. I'm in my bed. We sleep. We wake up the next morning, and Lisa's up, and she always gets up early, and she's sitting over there smiling and looking at me, and I'm like, like this, okay, and I'm getting up, and she says, David, it's like early morning. Yes, she said, it's time. It's time. Okay, it's time. What, what is the time? Okay, I'm getting up. It's time. No, it's time to get married. <laughs> now, this is early in the morning. And I said, okay, good. I said, uh, who, are you, who are you getting married to? <laughs> it's early in the morning. I'm still in bed, getting the sleep out of my eyes. And she goes, uh, you. <laughs> it's time to get married to you. Now, I'm always fascinated, like the talk I'm giving today, I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth. All my job is, is to stay tuned in to the Holy Spirit. And as I stay tuned in to the Holy Spirit, I'm observing like the rest of everybody else. I don't know what's going to come out of my mouth, but I know it's early in the morning, and I've got this little red car with, no muffler, with a bad muffler, and, and Lisa's over there proposing marriage right in the morning before I'm even out of bed and everything. So it was like a quick kind of proposal. We had these things before, but this was this is one particular case. And and then That's for sure. So I'm waiting I'm waiting to see what's gonna come out. So so after and she's waiting for an answer. <laughs> and so so I listen, what's the Holy Spirit gonna say? And the Holy Spirit says but you're already married. <laughs> she had conveniently forgotten that she was already legally married and she was proposing to me. But you see, 
I don't know all these details, but the Holy Spirit doesn't miss a thing. <laughs> I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit said, but you're already married. And she's like, oh my God, I, that's right, I am. <laughs> she said, that's how that one went. But then that was good because the man that she was married to, I told you she married a millionaire. And this millionaire kind of went insane and was committed. So she was married to a man who was in an institution. Legally insane in the mental institution. Legally. And at that time, he was in there for 12 years. For 12 years. Yeah. And so she didn't have a whole lot of contact with him, so she had conveniently <laughs> forgot a little detail. But the Holy Spirit doesn't miss anything. And it was so good because she's like, wow, am I in some kind of denial or what? Now... For most human beings, yes, they are in some kind of denial. <laughs> That's right. They're denying that they're, they're the Christ. <laughs> and they're playing this game of time and space. It's like a major sense of denial. In fact, one time Helen woke up with this blazing letter <coughs> that was like blazing. She'd always get these visions, but Helen Shuckman got this vision. Never underestimate the power of denial. It was in visuals, flaming visuals. And that's for everyone. That's not just for Helen Shuckman. You know, we're dealing with a major sense of denial where lots of things have been pushed out of awareness that need to come back into awareness so we can give them over to the Holy Spirit and heal from them. But what was practical about that too was then when we finally we made it to Cincinnati, we arrived at the Peace House, I, I put the car out on the, the street with a for sale sign, <laughs> and within a day it had sold for, for, the, for the exact amount that I, <laughs> that I paid for it. And I think Lisa paid the gas. See, this is how, you wonder, how do you live as a mystic? This is the kind of examples, you know. You've got to be open-minded here. You don't just, you're not supposed to fly you. Okay, what do you want me to do? And then we talked, and she actually went on the computer to begin to look at the possibilities and open to the possibilities of, of divorcing a husband that was in an institution that she didn't have much interaction with. And that turned into, it just goes on and on, yeah. that turned into a, another, another huge healing experience, a, one of many. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, he was diagnosed with uh, paranoid schizophrenia. So he didn't even think I was his wife anymore. You know, he was married to some other lady named Amy. And so, you know, I actually had told the doctors that I, he was still legally my husband because I thought I would have to be responsible for the bills. <laughs> so, you know, I was coming clean with everything, you know, with David. And so uh, it was so bizarre because I thought, okay, Spirit, you make this happen. Like after this joining, I thought, I don't know how this is going to happen. But now it's up in my awareness and I have to get divorced. And it was so bizarre because like three days later, the hospital called at, called me because I was on the list. And they said, you know, we're trying to get a hold of uh, Paul's sister. Do you know, you know, how, you know, who's legally responsible for him? And there it was right in front of me. Your first and, opportunity. Yeah. And I said, I said, you know, I just have to tell you, I'm married to him. I said, he's my husband and we're still legally married. And uh, the lady on the other other end was like, oh my God, this is terrible. She said, you mean you're still married to this guy? And I said, yeah, I'm still married to him. And she said, well, do you want to be married to him? And I said, no, I don't. She said, well, we have to have a meeting about this and we're going we're gonna to support you in getting divorced. You know, because my attorney had told me I couldn't divorce him because he wasn't legally competent. You know, that there was no way that I was ever going to be able to get a divorce. Well, they set up a whole meeting with the with him and talk to him and with these doctors and it was the most beautiful thing that they all supported because he actually was saying he was Colonel Sterling <laughs> he, he actually believed that he was this Colonel Sterling and they said even his documents he's signing Colonel Sterling Wow! <laughs> you know that he was you know that out of it that they that they didn't think that he would even be able to sign uh, these papers you know legally and it was so powerful because they set it all up, and his doctor was there. Um, uh, and so it was almost like the, everybody was there waiting to see what was going to happen. And he, he was in a locked unit, and I went in with the doctors there. 
And it was so beautiful because I was sharing. I said, you know, I want to get divorced and, you know, I want to thank you and da-da-da-da-da. And all of a sudden, he looked down and he looked at me. And I'm like waiting. My heart's pounding, you know, just wanting, you know, this to be clear. You know, I'm finished. And, and, and all of a sudden, he signs it and everybody's looking to what he signed. And he signed his name. We couldn't believe it. And I grabbed the paper. Clearly, <laughs> <laughs> he grabbed it too. And we started, he went, listen, we're running around the thing. And I'm like, no, it's a miracle. <laughs> and it was really, really beautiful. And then he said, well, if we had such a wonderful marriage, why are we getting divorced? <laughs> I told him how grateful I was for the marriage and everything. And, you know, he, did, he doesn't even, not, can't even see my son. He, I mean, the last time he saw my son, he didn't even know he was his son anymore. And so uh, it was a miracle. I, I ran out of the hospital with these documents. Like, just thank you, Spirit, you know, for freeing me from that. And as I recall, the first time that there was a call was saying, do you know anybody, any next of kin or anybody related to him? And Lisa said no. <laughs> and then, right. then she had so much guilt <laughs> over that that that's when the next call ensued. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was good. And so you can see where the spirit is so patient and just keep mm -hmm. waiting for the willingness, waiting for the opening, the little cracks of opening to undo this period, the sense of denial, the sense of guilt mm -hmm. that's there. It's just really undoing all this. But it's so buried, and mm -hmm. we have another friend, uh, Ernest, who's going through that now, who just started to come clean with mm. different debts, and he was completely unaware of all the, the, the debts that he had, all the money he had borrowed from people, from friends, and whatever, but the Spirit just systematically started to, when he said, I want to be healed, and made the prayer for that, then the Spirit would bring into awareness, <coughs> even ones that he had forgotten, that he had borrowed money from. Spirit was like, let's go through this very thoroughly with great integrity. And he's done an amazing mm -hmm. job with that. I think he's told me he's like within a couple months of clearing out everything that came up into awareness. But that's what we're doing. We're like saying, Ali Ali income free. All of you dark beliefs, whatever we've hidden in guilt and shame, please bring them up so that I can be free of them forever and I can come back to my state of pristine innocence. So let's Open it up. Like Isn't that great? Uh -oh. <laughs> it's great you're saying that because uh, I was at, I did a six week retreat. Uh, I've done a four week retreat and two six week retreats. I call them devotionals in Spain, in Mallorca, on the island of Mallorca, where I show these metaphysical movies and we have these expression sessions and all this and this. And the last one that I did, people had been with it for like, I think maybe close to five weeks. And there was a little pause where some people were, were moving or whatever, but I looked at the group and I said, do you really want to be healed? I said, if you, you have to be careful what you say, but if you really say it to the Holy Spirit and mean it, uh, you can actually say to the Holy Spirit, bring it on. <laughs> and I said, just, you must be prepared for what that happened. Well, I was, it was interesting, I think probably... Fifteen people in the room threw their arms in the air one at a time saying, bring it on. One lady was healed of cancer. I mean, the, the things that happened during those six weeks were life-changing. It just took them into like a whole new direction from what they had appeared to be in, a self-concept at the beginning of the six weeks, but every day through the opening their hearts and trusting and expressing. And then at the end, after like five weeks, bring it on. And they, I think, have gone on from that six-week retreat in, in amazing ways, a lot of them over in Europe. But that just, thank you for, for sharing that. That's what this is about. Bring it on. <laughs> great, great, great. Like here we seem to say that we have choices and everything that happens is 
like you choose, like what Joe was saying, and, and then there's another part in the course that says there's scriptures written, mm. as if like you don't really have any choices. It's just happening because uh, you know all things are working for good. And, uh, all things are nice and God will have new earth. No matter what happens, it's the way it should be happening. So I don't know. Um, I don't know that. I, although I feel like I'm, I'm, sometimes I have, I can choose to say a word or, or not to say the word, and then I'm thinking maybe because I'm not, I that I you know is 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 the thing that you know. So so she thinks like <laughs> she has to decide something, but maybe not. So I don't know if my question makes sense. I have a hard time understanding like the, the distinction between like. I'm making decisions and a script is written, I guess. That's yeah, that's very good. I think this relates very much to Joe's question. Like Joe was saying, I read things in the Course and I go, I don't believe that. I, at this point, I don't believe it. It's not an experience of mine. And so, even though that's in the workbook, the script is written, it's great that you're sitting next to Roxy because Roxy says, I think that things, I've got beliefs. I've got beliefs down there. and and. I could give you the dynamic is when a decision is pushed out of consciousness and pushed down into the unconscious, it turns into a belief. It actually goes from being a decision to a belief. So if you read like the rules for decisions section in the course, uh, he says decisions are continuous but you're not always aware that you're making them. Doesn't that give great insight into this whole idea of when decisions are pushed down out of awareness, then there's these operating beliefs. They're like, it's almost like having a, a computer and you've got these programs running on the hard drive and you worked for Intel for years, you know that when, when there's programs running, or if, let's say you have a virus running in the background, <laughs> and it's, it's downloaded onto your computer and it's running on the hard drive, you know, doing its destruction and wreaking havoc, but you aren't even aware. You, you're just going, hmm, my computer is getting slower and slower. I don't know why it's so slow. Well, then you go to an expert and they go, well, you've actually got a virus running. You're just not aware of it. You, you weren't aware of it. Very similar with the mind. That when beliefs are, are, when decisions are pushed out of awareness, we can think of it as like, like, let's say there's a child that's maybe three years old and the parents, his parents get divorced. And somehow he takes it on like he was the fault, he was the reason that his parents got divorced. You've heard those stories where somebody, just a child goes on with this real heaviness and, and shame and maybe 40 years later in therapy when they're 43 and the they're working with a the therapist and they go, they uncover this belief <coughs> that they made some kind of decision like, oh, mommy and daddy are getting divorced and it's my fault. Mm -hmm. And then they push it down out of awareness and it, it's an operating belief and it wreaks havoc on their relationships mm -hmm. and it plays out mm -hmm. over and over for years. Or you've heard of people that are alcoholic and maybe had married an alcoholic and then they get divorced and they marry another alcoholic and they get divorced and they marry another alcoholic. This is the dynamics of the mind where it just keeps playing out. I mean the Bible had this thing in there about the, it was something like the sins of the father are revisited to the third and fourth generations. Not that the sins are of the father but the belief in sin just keeps playing out in time and space until we go, this is crazy. I am not guilty. I am not going to keep invested in, into the belief of sin. That there's got to be more than sin. Like how did this sin start in the first place? And, and why does the devil have power? And, and, and how did this come about? And is there a healing or correction for this sin? For this belief in lack and, and belief in separation? So, so when you read the script is written, that there's something in your mind that goes, hmm, I would like to, to grasp that. That's what the workbook is designed to do. If you look at the first seven lessons of, of the workbook, you know, you, as you go through one, two, three, four, five, six, number seven is, I see only the past. 
So when he says later on the script is written, basically he's saying the same thing as lesson number seven. I see only the past. My mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. I've forgotten that I'm a dreamer of the dream. Now I think I'm a dream figure living in a dream. I think my life is in the dream. It's biological life now and I'm afraid, oh, I'm going to have to die someday. And I bought the whole story hook, line and sinker that I was born and I would die. Never forget though that Jesus is saying before Abraham was I am that who we truly are is the Christ, an eternal being that is neither born or dies, that never was born and never dies. But there's been a huge amnesia that's gone on. We're, we're in the dreamland of sleep. You know, we bought into this whole idea of sin and error, call it whatever you want to call it, and, and Jesus is just saying, it's been corrected already. Now, also, in addressing your question, the, you know, Jesus will say things like, um, there are decisions to be made, even if they are illusions. Okay? He's, he's like saying, you, in the ultimate sense, there, you just have to accept the atonement. There's just one decision to be made, and that's, that's an acceptance of the correction. However, as you move through it, that's, that's what Joe is saying, you know, there's certain things that are just, I don't believe them at this point, but we can talk about guidance, we can talk about, as you go through your daily decisions with your daughter, with your landlord, with your house or your roommates or whatever, those be they illusions, they, you still have to go through the unwinding. And that's why my book is titled, Unwind Your Mind Back to God. It's not snap your fingers back to God. It's not twinkle your nose or click your heels. Get your ruby <laughs> slippers out and click your heels and say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. No, wait, I haven't written that book, Click Your Heels Back to God. It's... It actually is, if you read the book, you'll start to see that there's a tracing back because you're reclaiming causation. You're starting to see, oh, it's not the world that's doing things to me as a person. It's actually thoughts in my mind that need to be released. They're just attack thoughts. Mm -hmm. They need to be released to the Holy Spirit. And that's how the healing occurs. However, you do experience yourself as a person. And when you do, no one can be given instructions. This is from the Matrix, you know, from the Oracle. Yeah. No one can be given more than they can comprehend. Even, you can't even make a decision that you're, you, aren't, you don't believe you're capable of making. Everybody who's watched the Matrix knows that finally in the Matrix, uh, Neo meets the architect. Remember that scene when Neo meets the architect? And the architect says to him, uh, there are two doors. One door, the door on your right, leads to the source. And the door on the left leads back to Trinity and the Matrix, going back to save the girl. The source <laughs> is on the right hand, and Trinity and the Matrix is on the left. Which one does he pick? It doesn't even take him very long. He's like all upset at the architect. Trinity. He's going back to save the girl, even though the source <laughs> is on the right-hand side. You see? These are, these are embedded even in our movies. They're, it's coming to us from all these angles, and it's only the beliefs that are out of awareness that are dictating the decisions. So let's say you believe you're V and you're making these decisions. Here's another line from A Course in Miracles. A decision is a conclusion based on everything that you believe. Ooh, that's, that's a good one. A decision is a conclusion based on everything you believe. So even your decision to come here to CMC today and to sit in these chairs this afternoon is a conclusion based on everything you believe about personhood, about time, about your spiritual journey. It's, it's just an acting out. It's like a motion picture of what you believe. And isn't that good news? Because if you start clearing your mind of all these false beliefs, you're going to be smiling. You're going to be reaching the point where you go, I see you, ego, and I'm not going to choose you anymore. 
I would rather go to the source instead of trying to save the hero of the dream and go through all these dramas and act this stuff out over and over in time and space, I'm coming back for the atonement. I'm going to go back to my creator. I'm going to go back to my perfect innocence, to my perfect love. So that's what's going on. You, every day you really need to feel it out, these decisions. How does it feel? What is it for? What is the purpose? So instead of of necessarily, you know, thinking, should I go to this or go to that or do this or do that? You start to ask more the purpose question. What is it for? Is this, is this decision going to take me in the direction of freedom and awakening? Or is this one of those old past patterns that I'm still looking for a solution, you know, in the, in the guilt, in the and we get better and better, we get more intuitive of like, no, that just doesn't feel right anymore. I'm, I'm just not going to, remember Groundhog Day with Bill Murray? Yeah. He steps, remember how many times he steps into that puddle? He keeps stepping into the puddle every day until one day he comes and he looks and he sees the puddle. And he puts his foot out over and he goes like this and then he hops over the puddle and that's the last time that his foot goes in the puddle. He's aware, as soon as he's aware of it, he does not go into that puddle anymore. That's what we're doing. Roxy? Oh, um, so, yeah, I, I'm going through a something, um, a big relationship drama of the world, and, you know, it's a script I wrote, and the script is written, um, yet, I'm wa I watch the script, and I'm wa I watch my ego act out, and I watch myself doing it, and it's acting out, and it's not doing nice stuff, it's doing not nice stuff. And I'm watching that, and I'm going, and I can see my ego, because I'm not, I'm not blind to it anymore. I can see, even I can watch, God, it wants to be right so bad, and it wants to, it wanted to be a victim, and it wanted to make the, the others wrong, and so bad. So I'm like, okay, Poppy, because that's what I call God. Poppy, what, what's the fear behind this compulsive need to be right? Mm. What's the fear behind that? Because my, the ego script that my ego keeps playing out is, look at how I've suffered at the hands of the world. Even the birth order in my family, the geography of where I chose to be born, the family I chose to incarnate into, all of it was to play out, look how I've been unfairly treated. That's my story. See how I've been unfairly treated. And this is just the continuation of the script. And, I'm just, and, I'm, and I know that I know the story. I, I wrote it. Oh, this is the see how I've been unfairly treated story. I know this one. I've been writing this for a long time. But I just, it's like, okay, I want to know what, what is that fear of that need to be right? What is driving that need to be right? What am I so afraid of? So would you speak on that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's that line in the Course, would you rather be right or happy? And yeah. uh, basically it's like what that means is would you rather be right about the, e the way the ego set this world up? Or would you rather be wrong about the way that the ego set this world up and happy? And so this obsession with being right about the way the ego set it up is really like it's an addiction and it's an obsession with this subject-object thing. In other words, in heaven there aren't subjects and objects. Uh, there's not some kind of a being that's got some other being above it or outside of it that's watching over it. You know, like some of those songs, God is watching us, God is watching us from a distance. I never did like that. I, that sounds a little creepy <laughs> to me. Is that supposed to be sentimentally good? Uh, is that I'm being watched from a distance? Oh great, God's like a, some kind of a lurker or pe peeping Tom. I don't know, I, I, I'm not, I can't relate to peeping Tom God, you know. So I was like, oh. 
that doesn't sound good. But, but what this is, is this is like the undoing of this whole subject-object thing. And, and when you even look at science nowadays, that's what quantum physics is doing. It's saying this whole subject-object split is crazy. It's all connected. It's all unified. It's all this unified energy and connectivity. They call it entanglement, but it's actually, it's all completely unified. There's no subject and object. The ego perceives oneness as annihilation, because it's so identified with the subject-object. It has to be right about the subject-object. It has to be right about two-ness. It's terrified of oneness, so it's, got, it's really going to do everything in its power to convince the mind that O2 is real. Uh, I, I always think that Three Dog Night song, I don't know if you remember from decades ago, one is the loneliest number that you'll ever know. Two can be as bad as one. It's the only, it's the loneliest number since the number one oh. I'm like, isn't that great? I mean, you start to see these old songs and you go, boy, that is fascinating. You know, it's, now it's making one as bad and, and two is almost as bad as one, you know. It's got a real pessimistic view of everything. And it's, it's a death wish. What would you expect out of a death wish? You know, it's dark. So, what we're seeing is that it's, a, it's afraid of annihilation, so the ego interprets love as the great destroyer. And it's afraid of intimacy, it's afraid of love, and it's, a, it's definitely afraid of even exposure. It wants to keep the whole trick going by keeping this unconscious, unconscious and hidden. And then as you start to expose, we all know that, even in relationships when there seems to be a vulnerability around just sharing emotions. Here's what's going on for me. Please don't take it personally, but I'm going through a, a rough time and this, these are the thoughts I'm having and these are the experiences that I'm having. So, I, and that just gets acted out in relationships. With our community, we so much emphasize no people pleasing, no private thoughts. Those are our guidelines that we are continually having expression sessions where people are revealing and exposing what's going on in consciousness. It could be anything. It could be porn, it could be food addictions, drug addictions, all kinds of judgments, everything that's been pushed down and pushed out of awareness. And that's all just a symbol of the willingness to not hide. You know, the, the relationships we call forth are really just reflections of where our mind is. So you're just coming more to that point where you're saying, I'm worth it. I'm worth the healing. I'm worth the innocence. I'm, I'm not going to just give way and keep playing out these relationships where I seem to be victimized or mistreated because there's still that subject-object thing that's, that's going on in there. That's what it is. This is sort of a corollary. Um, I was really asking Spirit about trust, and I was going through a whole unwinding where um, the impermanence, deaths happened in my house crumbling, I, everything like that. And um, I, I had a thing last week where I went really back, 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 you know, crying in this trust thing, and uh, and went back to like when I was a kid, the feeling that the world wasn't safe um, from various experiences. And I said, wow, maybe, you know, I let that sink in as a belief and then projected it everywhere the rest of my life. And all of a sudden I saw this whole pattern of being attacked and things happening to me and even the disappointments with people, even on that level as just being a manifestation of, I'm not safe. And so I said, there seemed to be a, an antidote to that that appeared, which was, it, it, it like popped me up for a minute where I was saying, I, tr I said, what's the opposite of that? I, I trust the world, I trust my brothers and sisters as Christ. I and. You know, it felt really good to say it. And and so, the place I am today, right now, this minute, is hearing that the affirmations aren't useful. 
and wondering kind of about that being, and it, it's a little bit the same kind of question I heard be asking. It's like, is there, a, it came to me, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm doing an affirmation or, you know, I've, the whole pattern was just there of, whoa, I've created this my entire life, the same thing all the mm -hmm. time, replaying, mm -hmm. replaying, replaying. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder about that. Um, like, the, whether that place of, I, I trust the world, I trust my brothers and sisters as Christ before me, is like an antidote to the to the, um, to the not feeling safeness that I think might be a source of my catalyzing all that. that this is a dangerous place. This place has hurt me. It's always going to hurt mm -hmm. me. Yeah, I think it, it's a question. It, when I look at the workbook of A Course in Miracles, I can see those early lessons in that first part of the workbook is clearly designed to undo, expose and undo what is believed in, including linear time. But starting with lesson number one, nothing I see means anything. He's not going to start off with affirmations when it's like in the, the, the movie uh, What the Bleep Do We Know, Michael Ledwith talked about when we use just affirmations, it's like a smear over the darkness. Mm -hmm. He, he is a beautiful, a theologian with a beautiful way of describing affirmations. It's just like a smear over what's believed to be very dark. So Jesus w does what we might call shadow work. Uh, you know, his whole text is shadow work. Talking about sepulchers and blood that shines like rubies and, and tears that are like diamonds. I mean, he's graphic with his words saying, you've got a lot of shadow work to do. You know, don't think that you're just going to go affirm your way back to God. If, like, if, like, you remember the some of the old uh, Catholic practices of of saying saying different prayers and things. Well, or the days of affirmations and the power of positive thinking. He's basically saying, you know, we're going to go and we're going to start to dismantle and expose what you do believe. So the early part of the the workbook is is that. And then as you move your way into the workbook, he'll come zooming in with affirmations. I am as God created me. My holiness envelops the world. My holiness envelops everything I see. My holiness. You see, Jesus is going to use them both. But he's not just going to jump into the affirmations because he's saying you have to undo what's underneath. You have to raise to awareness and expose what you actually do believe to be real before you can accept what is real and true. So for example, he'll talk about private thoughts in the workbook. He'll say, you have no private thoughts and yet that's all that you believe in. <laughs> so he's like saying, oh you really don't have any private thoughts and yet your mind is filled with private thoughts. <laughs> you, you've got a hallucination going on here where you, you've got all these attack thoughts that he talks about in in the course of Lesson 23, I think it's, I, I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. He's not only saying there are attack thoughts there, but you need to let them go. And that'll be the key to everything. But he's not, he's not, he's, he's doing like a master spiritual psychologist. He's starting off with undoing what you do currently believe and make way for the affirmations. So, you know, instead of like using the power of your mind to try to, to bring things into awareness to manifest them, it's more uh, clear your mind and open to your real thoughts, which are beneath your attack thoughts, the false thoughts. And eventually, uh, I was just watching the, the lessons that Tony's posting on his conference site. He's going through this group of uh, lessons now where it starts off with, my mind is holds only what I think with God. That's like the core repeated idea. Yeah. My mind holds only what I think with God. That's an affirmation. But specifically, you have to come towards that lesson by clearing away everything that you perceive and think that's involved with the ego. 
Otherwise, how are you going to know my mind holds only what I think with God? Those previous lessons are all important. They all lead to it. So when people say, you know, do you do TM? Do you, what, how do you meditate? What posture do you use? Do you use breath work and everything? I said, no, of Course in Miracles was my path. And they said, do you have training in meditation? I said, sure I did. Jesus. It's the workbook. <laughs> you don't think he's going to give you a pathway to awakening. He, that's your whole pathway. Is, is you study the text, which helps you get clearer about the direction and the, and the ideas, the metaphysics, and then you do the workbook. And I actually got to that point where I had to say, okay, whatever I've learned before, my techniques and da 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 da, I'm not even going to try to play mix and max, match with Jesus. I'm going to do what he says. He's giving me a workbook and he's giving me simple instructions. And he's saying, there's only two every day. You know, as best you can, try not to make exceptions, which is there our title again, Love Makes No Exceptions. And, you know, don't do more than one lesson a day. That's pretty simple. Two instructions. How willing am I to practice those. How willing am I to say, okay, you are the master, you are the way shower, you've been through this and you've come out outside beyond this entire time-space cosmos, you're back in eternity, so that's why you're the way shower. How willing am I to practice what you've given me? Instead of throwing up distractions and throwing up rebellions and throwing up rejection and throwing up resistance. Mm -hmm. That's the core. And I did say that, I've said it many times, that I feel like the Course is 1% principle and 99% practice. Not that the 1% needs to be dismissed, that's why we have these clear discussions about metaphysics and that's why we study. It's in, and it's a very important 1% because if you don't get the 1% right, then you've got 99% practice of something that's erroneous. <laughs> so the 1% is extremely important, but still, unless you put it into practice, then you're still going to have defenses against the actual experience of, of love's presence. So I think, to me, it just became something in my life where I thought, wow, you'll believe this Course entirely or not at all. I just said to Jesus, okay, I accept. Not at all is not an option for me. <laughs> I'm not going to, this isn't like jarts or horseshoes, <laughs> clink. It's pretty close. Jesus is like, no, I told you entirely or not at all. It did remind me of the old Christian things, like all or nothing, but it wasn't in terms of whether you wear a hat in church or all these little specific rituals. It was in terms of purity. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. So to me, the practice is the most important thing, and at least we'll tell you over the years, mm. that's, that's what we focus on. Mm. That's how you get good at true empathy at overlooking error. Mm. In fact, it got to the point, you know, with our community where, you know, there was one time when Lisa and I were at the monastery and we were, we were, had offices right next to each other and there was this big scream that went out, it was just screaming and screaming and screaming. Mm. And Lisa's in the little cubicle next to me and she's like, who died? Because mm. it, 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 it sounded like somebody had just been murdered. Been murdered. Right. It was like, Baraka shrieks and screaming and screaming, and so she, she says, who died? And I just smiled. So we waited, and then, but then <laughs> just to see, okay, this screaming, what's next? You know, nothing, nothing to and get And then we hear this big banging on the door, and it's, it's Sue, and she's there like, oh my God, it's the worst thing in the whole wide world. She was screaming and crying. Right, right. She walked in on her husband watching poor child corner. I don't know, something... Porn, the, right in the act of it or something. They, well, no, they had they had come and and they had brought a computer from Australia, and you know how the browsers have search history and everything. They were up and she was she was searching for something with their computer, mm -hmm. and she started typing something in. I think she misspelled something, and right up comes this pornographic site, and it was on her and her husband's computer and then then she just lost it. It just had a reaction to the whole thing. And so for us, it was like, 
we always know it's, there's healing happening, it's like, oh, let's see where this is going, and then uh, after all this screaming, we found that somebody had not been murdered, uh, it was just screaming as if somebody had been murdered. Mm. So then the lunchtime is expression session, then, then it was a discussion, expression session about porn. Everybody's eating their lunch and the whole porn discussion comes up. We're kind of like, oh well. It was oh, beautiful well. actually because yeah. a lot of the guys there had so much shame. And, and it being exposed was for everyone sitting there in the room. And it was just this huge gift, like us being able to talk about it, you know, uh, just the shame in the hiding that. And so it was just so powerful. It was the hugest gift for the monastery. It was actually the theme for like about two weeks. Yeah, it was so healing. Mm. You know, when you really have the faith that the Holy Spirit can handle anything, and you're not afraid of certain thoughts coming up, mm. then you're really on a track for some really quick healing. Mm. There was one time, too, when I was down in, uh, I don't know if you were with me that time, but I was down in, I think, Noosa, Australia, and I was doing a whole week retreat where we were using, having big sessions like this, and, and expression sessions, and this and this, and in the middle of the week, this guy shows up and he's like, oh my God, I, 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 need to be, I, I need to be here, I need to be part of this and everything, even though we're already halfway through the whole thing, you know, it's midweek and everything. And so he's like, please, please, can I come, can I join in the group? And so I kind of opened it up to the whole group, it was a group bigger than this uh, there, and I said, here he is, and he came in, and he's like going around, saying, please, can I, can I be part of your healing circle, healing group? And everyone's like... Yes, yes, we love you. Come here, we'll hug you and come on. You'll come, come in in the middle. It doesn't matter. You missed the first half of the week, but you're here and it's all, there's no accidents and this and this. So they welcome the guy in. And so the, he's only there for the last three and a half days of the retreat. So as we go into the big sessions, everybody's sharing all their private thoughts and he's got all these pedophile thoughts. He's going to open up about all of his pedophile thoughts. Well, Everyone, most of the people there are like, oh, you know. And so, he goes on for the first day, and then the second day, and the third day. I'm having all these women, mothers, coming in for one-on-one -on -one counseling. Like, oh, I can't stand to hear them. Oh, my gosh. Pedophile thought. You know, it doesn't matter. They're all mm -hmm. thoughts. We have to come to the point of seeing these highly judged thoughts are there for, for healing. And, you know... I've had people do one-on-ones -on with me, I, oh, I've got this guilt, and I tried to have sex with an animal, and that, you know, I just hear all kinds of things, but even as I'm doing the one-on-ones, people will kind of look me in the eye, and it's just that look of like, are, will you still love me if I expose my deepest and my darkest thoughts? And, and I'm just kind of there smiling and looking at them telepathically, yes, that's why we're here. Or even going to China, where there's been all this systematic repression, and they have, they don't even know what an expression session is. Mm. They, it was almost like an explosion of giving them permission to let their, their darkest thoughts come up, their darkest secrets, and you could see instantaneously how they were, they were healing. They were feeling like, wow, if I can express my darkest thoughts and not be judged, then that shows me that I can be free of them. Mm. Mm. If I keep drawing forth witnesses of judgment, then that just reinforces mm. that they're real. You see how that works? It's the, mm. That's the presence of the Holy Spirit, freeing the mind of whatever those thoughts are. So, it's been almost like an honor, even that woman who came and whose husband, she was a course student, and I, was he even... Is he a course student too, or I Where was this at? in Mexico, the one who, who threw himself off? Oh right, off. they both were. They were both course yeah. students, mm -hmm. and the husband had thrown himself off of the, this floor right. and, and plummeted to his death. But, but again, it was Lisa's opportunity for healing, to stay mm -hmm. in, in the truth. And then that love just could be felt. And then right away the woman was like, that's what she was looking for. I need a witness for truth. I need to join mm. in what's real and true. And then with the children right there, mm. with a couple of them on the floor lying right there, you know, that everything reflected out, mm. that love. It's important. Mm. Thank you. Um, since you've been on the journey for a while, and you've obviously been really authentic with the Course. I know you've probably bumped up against your own deep fears along the way, maybe every day, maybe every moment, who knows. But 
I was wondering if you could maybe take one of your scariest moments on the course, what you thought you were being asked to do, but your own resistance came up in spades, and, and maybe how you can tell us maybe what you heard from the Holy Spirit, maybe a little quip, or maybe it was a one-liner or just a feeling, but if you could tell us what you received that helped you go over one or two of your bigger barriers, if there was something. Because I know in my own life, years ago when I was in a deep place with the Course, I was hitting up against some deep walls. I couldn't seem to get over them, but I kept praying through it and, and all that. And something came to me that was really helpful, which was it felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, um, God only gives, he never takes away, like that line from the Course, God is only a giver, never a taker, and that really helped me, I thought, oh, this thing that I think might be taken away from me if I were to really go full force with the Course, yeah. that's just my ego, God's not interested in taking anything away, it's his nature to give, in fact, he has to give, according to the Course, to be God, he has to give, it's not even an option in a way. I guess it is, because he's free, but still. His, God's whole nature is giving, according to the Course. But when the Holy Spirit brought that to my attention, it helped me get over that hurdle. So I was wondering if you had one or two gems along your own path that helped yeah. you. I think that's good. I would say there was a time where I was working in a voc rehab kind of setting, and, and job coach setting, and uh, uh, there was a there was an 18 year old student that I was working with as an assignment. It was early with the course. My work with the course, reading the course, praying, meditating, doing lessons, and and going working as a job coach. And I remember uh, working with this young man and I, helping train him to be a busboy at a at a hotel. And so it was back at the restaurant of the hotel, and I was working with him on a on a daily basis, and actually, and and at one point, um, his behavior seemed to get what the world would say is a bit more erratic, and um, and he seemed to be kind of deteriorating in some way. What the world would say in terms of his his attentiveness, his behavior, and so on and so forth. And then finally, it was Friday the thirteenth, and uh, I, I would say I don't even believe in all this Friday the thirteenth stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was a full moon. <laughs> And um, mm. and I suddenly found myself. I felt like I was in uh, the Exorcist movie or mm. in uh, one of the Jack Nicholson uh, Shining. Shining. I think I, I, it suddenly I, it was an evening. It was Friday the Thirteenth, the full moon, and everything. And I I would I remember sitting down with him and talking with him about Jesus uh, at that because I felt like that was important. But as the night went on, his behavior, uh, like he, he's had this kind of energy or funny thing going on seemingly in his eyes as I would look at him and talk to him and then his voice would, would drop like three or four octaves to this deep, dark uh, voice and, uh, and be speaking. And the people around him, this was like in, in like a hotel and a restaurant, they were getting seemingly spooked. Uh, it was like a, it was like being one of these Hitchcock movies or something. And here I'm doing my course lessons and I'm just an honest course student doing everything. And, and it continues on in the night. And then um, I, as part of coaching, I'm training him. So I've got to, you know, I'm busting along with him. I'm taking these heavy... Uh, trays that have silverware and all this stuff in and helping him do this as, as part of my job to train him and everything and I'm going, he's coming one direction, I'm going the other and I start to see he's trying to stick his foot out when I'm carrying this big heavy tray of water and silverware and I feel like he's trying to like, like trip me. And then at one point as this continues on and people are getting more and more spooked and then so finally there was this task that he had where it was a long, narrow set of dark steps that go from the kitchen down to the area, which is the parking lot where they have the, the dumpster and everything. And you've got to take like a big, tall, plastic garbage can that when it's full of all this slop and everything, weighs hundreds of pounds. And so he's supposed to take, that's part of his job duty is to take it down and out. 
So I had to assist him. So I'm supposed to side by side take it. So we go over to the exit and I'm just looking at him and his eyebrows go up like, uh, like Jack Nicholson. His eyebrows raise up and he goes, you first. <laughs> And I'm like thinking, this is pretty steep. Uh, not the stairs. <laughs> I mean, uh, so, anyway, at the end of the night, uh, somebody called the police. Uh, and they brought an ambulance. And they took him out and they strapped him down in, a, in a, an ambulance and took, took him away. His name was Richard. And so I went home. Uh, and I had my course book, and I'm opening up, and I'm talking to Jesus. Like I, I said, this is a little steep. I know you would never give anybody anything that they can't handle, but I said, this is just a little freaky, a little steep. And I said, could you, act, could you tell me what is going on? Because, um, and I don't think, I don't believe in like demons and exorcism and possessions and all these kind of things uh, consciously. But could you explain what's going on? And Jesus said, I'm showing you the map of your heart. I'm showing you where there's still, you still have fear. That he again acknowledged, no, there was no external demons or external world or nothing about full moons and Friday the 13th or anything. I'm just showing you the map of your heart. And, and to me, I, again, when you say bring it on or you say... I want to be healed, or you know, you, you offer the prayer up, sometimes it, it can seem, it can be interpreted as being quite intense. We've had that with relationships, you know, where it gets extremely intense, mm -hmm. or like Sundari was talking about, the death, death of, of your mother, or, or a lot of people in your, your story. These are all just opportunities for forgiveness, you know. To, to really work and practice with prayer and opening up and using whatever particular lesson is given to stay with and that's, that's what came to me. It was very, very helpful. And I, I think that was a major one and if there was one other one that comes to mind, just a parable was I, you know, how the lessons are so synchronized with what's happening in your life. Like I, I remember I was on lesson 136, sickness is a defense against the truth. And that particular day, I was reheating a plate of food in uh, the microwave, started to feel nauseous, started to feel like, queasy, and started to, well, I was just still watching my thoughts, oh, maybe I'm catching the flu, and this is, this is the 24 hour, the 48 hour, you know, the typical kind of thoughts, you're watching your thoughts, and then the diarrhea feeling, and then racing in, and going on the toilet, and then it was only sitting on the toilet that my lesson of the day came in. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, 136, sickness is a defense against the truth. And in a lot of lessons, Jesus will say, here's, here's the lesson, let related thoughts. That's a pretty long lesson. I think the next lesson, the lesson before, 135, I think is the longest lesson in the book. So 136 is pretty long. And so I was there on the toilet, with these nauseous feelings and diarrhea and all this, and watching my thoughts, and then I let related thoughts come in. Sickness is a decision that you make when you're too afraid of love and healing. And so I started letting more thoughts come in from recalling the lesson. And the more I sat there on the toilet, I was really like taking it in, like, wow, this is a decision that I'm making. And I thought, what is this decision I'm making? And I started to realized that either everything that Jesus had told me in A Course in Miracles was true, or what's the alternative? That Jesus was the biggest liar of all time. True? Liar. And, and, and somehow that was good because that was an important distinction I was making mm -hmm. because when I went, okay, it, is this true? Do I accept what Jesus is teaching me? Or is Jesus the biggest liar of all time? Well, I, I think a lot of us get into spirituality because of our love for God and Spirit and Jesus even. And, and so I started to let my love for Jesus 
come in strong. Which, is, which way am I going to go here? Help, he's true, he's helping me, or he's the biggest liar of all time. And I, when the love grew stronger, and I started feeling the love of Christ in me, sitting on the toilet, feeling it, feeling it stronger and stronger and stronger, I went deeper into my mind to that point of decision. And I, I got so into the love, and so into the miracle, that I went, this is impossible. And boom, in that very instant, all the symptoms, everything vanished. The diarrhea feeling and everything. It was a very powerful experience of practical application of not just pushing it off, but actually going down deeper and deeper and deeper, which is really what the Course is asking us to do. So that one really stood in my awareness too, because I, at that point, I mean, I hopped up off that toilet, and I went back to the, uh, some of my thoughts were, now I'm not going to have dinner. <laughs> when you've got the diarrhea and the queasy feeling, I got up and I said, I'm going back out there. I reheated the, <laughs> the meal. I had a beautiful meal, because I was back in my right mind. And so that was, was very convincing. So I think that's why we share our experiences too, not just the metaphysics, but you need to share, oh, this is what I was confronted with, this is what I did, and this is what happened. Just like in 12 Steps programs, you know, it's the same power of the miracle. That's good, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Dan, mm -hmm. may I ask you, um, so I've been hearing anger is not, he does not justify anger at all. So I have a little anger problem. So now I've been, and it was all justified. Well, you know, been through all what I've been through, all that. So I'm really working on that. When I get jolted up with unexpected, you know, just unexpected, and then I've been hearing, you, we want to bring it up to the light. We don't want to bring the dark, I mean, we don't want to bring the light into the illusion. So, I guess my question is, I don't want to sit down and delve in, why am I angry, why I don't want to do that. Do I, can I, just stop, is it sound to, okay, I'm, I feel that I'm angry, it's old crap that I don't even need to go back into, I'm giving it to you. Is that sound? Yeah, I think you have to be welcoming of, of all the emotions that are coming up. In other words, instead of denying and repressing, you're, you're basically saying, I'm not going to deny it anymore. And so that's actually giving yourself permission to let these, these thoughts and these emotions come up into awareness. There's actually, I have this thing called Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment, and, and I, through music and through movies, I've, I've felt like I, I allowed the Holy Spirit to speed up the healing process, especially through the movies. But um, I, I have a friend who I, I showed this movie to. There was like four of us that watched it maybe a, a week or t a couple weeks ago, called Perfect Sense. And if anybody, it's a very rare movie, but if you get a chance to watch Perfect Sense, I think it would be very, very helpful. If you can watch it with the Spirit's direction, it can be hugely insightful. It can, it can be an enormous speed up. Because any of you who have seen that movie, Perfect Sense, know that, that it's, it takes place mainly in Europe, but involves other parts of the world where mysteriously um, people start feeling their emotions uh, in much more of an intense way. They will feel the anger or, you know, the different emotions in a, almost like an overwhelming way, which almost like takes, it takes over their functioning in the world. And the whole world is experiencing this particular emotion. So the whole world's going through like a tsunami of this emotion coming up, almost like the repression and denial have been turned, and, and whatever was blocking is unblocked. So this huge emotion comes up, and then after the emotion comes up, it's almost impossible to handle, then there's a loss of one of the five senses. <coughs> and then as it goes on, humanity adapts and adjusts as it always tries to do, and then another huge emotion comes, a d different version of emotion comes up in a huge way, and then a, then a second sense of the five senses is lost. And then a third one comes up and hits all of humanity, the whole globe, and a third, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> where this goes, but it's, 
it's taking the whole world as we know it and whoever made this movie is is turning the tables on the ego because I will say that you know for my friend I showed her this movie she's been in spirituality and metaphysics for a long time at the end of the movie with a little bit of my commentary she just had this look on her eye like and she just said that is the best movie I have ever seen bar none because of the purpose of healing uh, you know some people could see that as a horror movie uh, but when you start to know the dynamics of how those emotions are kept by being hidden and that they need to be exposed and also the idea that we we perceive something valuable through the five senses you know that's that's a predominant belief like if somebody says to you I've lost my eyesight it's like oh god that's you know that's a terrible handicap or if, if you're deaf or if you know you're you have multiple things like that people would say they're tremendously handicapped compared to the rest but what if it's all flipped around what if it's as if Jesus says in the in the course the body's eyes he says in the course were made not to see and the body's ears were made not to hear you see how backwards and upside down this world is that that the healing has to occur in the mind and that the five senses are are actually not receptors we're not really getting uh, audio sound waves going in and hitting the eardrum and then those little neurotransmitters going in the brain to tell us the ears are instead of being like receptors they're like speakers they're broadcasting and these eyes that we you know we were trained in our education that the light waves come in and then the image is re reversed and all that and the transmitters take it in and the brain interprets mm -hmm. the eyes are projectors not receptors the ears are speakers they aren't receptors everything that we've learned and believed is all from the ego and that's how radical we have to do with what quantum physics does for us it, it takes us way beyond Newton Newtonian it just shows us everything we were raised in our history books and our science books was false all of it it was it was seemingly true through empiricism and through the five senses and through all the experiments that were made but all of that was made by the ego to keep us blind to our Christ self when you get deeper into these kind of teachings and you you see these guided movies you can have expansive states of awareness that come that I would say are even more sometimes intense than drug experiences so I'm I'm working with people without the drugs <laughs> I'm using the movie watchers guide to enlightenment and people are having mystical experiences they're having huge consciousness opening experiences from the spirits use of of movies and it seems like every day or two somebody's sending me another movie that I have not heard about I'm getting tips I got one from uh, uh, the Netherlands is um, you some of you might have seen it uh, Danny Darko or something like that so I go to YouTube and I'm like what is this he gives me a clip and then I start to read the commentary and there's all this commentary on this movie apparently it's been this huge kind of awakening movie and I was like hmm how fascinating or I started I, a movie I had watched uh, called Gone Girl did anybody see Gone Girl it's yes with, with Ben Affleck well here I am watching Gone Girl and, and I'm watching it with all the commentary on perception and it's all the teachings of the Course but whoever's doing this commentary is showing it's so extreme it's so extreme of having an identity that's based on a concept of being a wife and being a husband and you know when I, some of the people in our community even watched Gone Girl they had been watching movies for years and they had reactions coming up with Gone Girl and and the reactions were how can they make a movie that shows that much manipulation they had never seen a movie that had that much manipulation devious insidious manipulation in it and it had triggered a lot of things uh, one person even wrote 
out of all the, the feminine villains throughout history, this is the most devious feminine female villain of all time. <laughs> you know, because it was like it was more like Hitchcock. He was extremely psychological. She faking a death and faking abuse and like I mean faking it in an extreme way, using a hammer uh, when she wanted to be perceived as abused, like using a hammer on her head and and uh, murdering, you know, to, to fit what was wanted, but, but covering it in so many ways, devious ways, that, you know, it's like the stuff that people try to do in these mystery movies, except this was like such precision, you know, to put it together. And so then I, I watched the commentary on that, which was all about perception, about external perceptions having a reality. And these are very deeply embedded beliefs. You know, Tony, that was part of our last conference in Las Vegas, Tony used what some people considered extreme uh, teaching devices uh, for the, the Sunday service and there were reactions and it did flush uh, out of the hiding places a lot of uh, people's beliefs uh, around certain things, maybe around conferences and ministers and you know stuff like that it's, it's, it was nothing so extreme as in Vegas it probably you know what but in the context it's the beliefs that get flushed up and that's that's what the healing's about we must come to a point where we follow Jesus's teachings to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold not one can be kept hidden or it will obscure your learning. So when we look at that title, Love Makes No Exceptions, we're not really looking at exceptions in the world of form, we're looking at exceptions in your thoughts. We're looking at exceptions in your beliefs. Do not hold back on the miracle. Let the miracle be like a lighthouse. Let the light of the Holy Spirit sweep around to all the dark corners of the mind. Make, let it make a full 360 degree sweep and be able to forgive what you still believe is unforgivable. And what does he mean by that? You know, what, what, what does that really mean? There's one part of the Course where Jesus says, your one problem, your one remaining problem is that you believe that you must forgive the truth. <laughs> forgive the truth. What does he mean by that? Forgive what you believe your five senses are showing you. You believe that what your five senses are showing you is the truth. And somehow now you've got to just paint white lilies and take your white brush out and paint over this devious dark thing <coughs> that you're convinced is wrong, is horribly wrong. And it's also why in a lot of course groups people will frequently bring up Hitler. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon for people to say, what about yeah. Adolf Hitler? And, and again, or maybe Saddam Hussein, or uh, maybe Osama bin Laden. George Bush. George Bush. <laughs> Did ever, anybody ever see that, that? Was that Zero Dark Thirty, that, that one? <laughs> I, I watched that movie, and the one, the, the, really the scene that really got me the most was when the, the, the woman who persisted, Jessica Chastain played the woman, when she finally had to get to the body bag and, and be the one that identifies Osama bin Laden's face after this almost like a witch hunt <laughs> uh, to find it and zips open the bag and then she looks at it and just the look on her face was more like, I did all that <laughs> to look at a body's face, you know, I mean the, to me that showed the contradiction of the world, you know, like you've been looking in the wrong place for your villains, you've been projecting it out onto terrorists, you've been projecting it out onto all these politicians and all these spouses, you know, most homicides take place within families, you've been projecting it onto, onto your loved ones, <laughs> you know, and that's where we have like Cape Fear, remember, counselor, counselor, if any of you have seen Cape Fear with Nick Nolte and 
No, it, it's, you project it out because you don't want to forgive it in your mind. You would rather see the villain, the terrorist, the evil as being in the world. And Jesus is basically turning it around and he's saying, no, you have to face your own self-hatred. You have to face, he says, the full, until you face the full extent of your own self-hatred, you will not be free of it. You have to face the rage, you have to face the extreme darkness with the Holy Spirit's help and see the nothingness of that belief and that thought and then you're, you're free, you're back in eternity. So we are mighty companions to one another. We are here to support facing that, that you might say, just belief, tiny mad idea inside. And we are here to do that with our whole life. Oh, and it's, we have also reached the end. When people start to leave, I always go, oh yeah, it must be, <laughs> it must be time. Here he goes. Well, one more. One uh, very long one. <laughs> I didn't want to come to it. Susan uh, translates to you and loves you. Now I love you. Hmm. And this is my challenge. Challenge. All the time. But. I go to all that is a result. It's another thing I go out to It's is absolutely very difficult to do. So I haven't been practicing Jesus for a long time. I was born again in 76. But where I came from, the anger and the rage was short time. But I believe in Jesus. I believe that the man walked in the right. He's a teacher. And here I am, uh, pondering for, for 20 years a life of James. Be still and know that I am God. It's been a force, a good force for me for my entire life. But I don't understand. Is it be still and know that I am God? Because I am manifest, I am physical. Or is it be still and know that I am God? Which is a statement. But there's an outside force other than me. And I wanted to leave here with two. One, to tell you I love you. Possibly life changing from doing your soul. And my surrender was May 26th, 1986. When I rolled off the bed because I had heard reverences kneeling, and I rolled off the bed. My knees hit the ground, thinking I'm going to the floorboards. I share that because I make a commitment. It's a beautiful new year. Mm. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's very powerful. Be still, know that I'm in God. And I think that that, that is the, the Spirit's presence offering us all the love of, of God. And and with A Course in Miracles, the more that I, I just gave myself fully over to it, it was, at one point Jesus says, even the statement, the Father and I are one, he says, has two parts. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting, tell me more. Because sometimes as Christians, I was raised as Christian, and I thought, well, Jesus was God, you know. I would make that association, and he says, no, he says, Things like in the Bible, you know, uh, why do you call me good? God is good. He's always pointing at the Creator, at the Source. And there's even a workbook lesson in the Course in Miracles where he says, Jesus says, I choose the second place to gain the first. How humble to come to this experience that, that God is the Creator and that on, the only one that in which awe, or awesome, awe is, is appropriate with, is the Creator. Jesus says, don't use awe with me. There's one. And there was a beautiful uh, 
thing in this book, Absence from Felicity, where um, Helen Shuckman, the scribe of the course, went into a Catholic church, and they went down, you know, to the to the front towards towards the altar, her and her collaborator Bill, and she knelt down at the altar, and her collaborator Bill knelt down at the altar, and then Jesus appeared to them, and he came over and he knelt down at the altar with them. And that, to me, is just a symbol, but it gives that feeling, you know, that of, of just love for God, you know, that, that we're doing this all for the glory of God. There is no sense of personal gain or personal recognition. There is nothing that puts any person or place or thing higher it's there's so much humbleness in in that and to me that's that's what i think of and that's how i feel in terms of my relationship with with jesus and with god is that humbleness so when he says i and the father are one he's basically saying we are one spirit and even with the trinity you know god the father god the son god the holy spirit you know the holy spirit is like our bridge our way of remembering heaven and God and Jesus was was an example for us the manifestation of the Holy Spirit so that we would have a way shower that would that we could learn from his actions and his behaviors uh, and a lot of Christians will say to me you know WW uh, JD um, what would Jesus do WW JD and I think what Jesus is saying in the Course is WWJT. What would Jesus think? He's saying, we have to think alike in order to know God. Don't be so concerned about the behaviors, getting it right and acting right and let what you do comes from what you think. Let's work on the thoughts because that's where the purification occurs. So, with that, I say thank you to everything. Yeah, thank you. She has a, a Golden, Golden State game to go to now. Okay, a uh, couple of quick announcements. If you are new here and you did not sign in our book, please sign in our book and uh, give us your email address if you would so we can keep notifying you about uh, special events, especially coming up. The next uh, special speaker that we're going to have is Reverend Maria Philippe, and she is going to be here on Wednesday, July 27th to give an evening lecture. Also, uh, we have these little um, introductory information things about uh, the center and what we do here and all the different things that we do here, so please take one of these. And uh, I know uh, some of you have been to our conferences and some of you have not been to our conferences, uh, we put out a, a recent issue of Miracles Monthly, actually just got mailed on Friday. So it's a special issue, it's longer than most of our issues. It has uh, eight different articles, one written by each of the staff members about what the conference experience was like for them, plus it has 17 full-color pictures of the conference in here. So take one of these, read it, you'll get a real broad view of what conferences are like, and uh, I'll keep the dates in mind, I sure hope you come. Okay, let's give a nice round of applause for Dave. Oh, and that thing that I read earlier that people wanted, what I could probably do is take a, a picture of it and put it on my, sure. my Facebook uh, public page, not the profile, but so that anyone can, mm. can go for it. And they could just click on it and print it out or whatever. That's the simplest. <laughs> okay, have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you for coming.